And I'm going to be exploring the fifth chapter of the book Encounters with Jesus by Timothy Keller that we've been looking through recently. In this episode, we are going to be exploring what faith is through the encounter that Jesus has with Mary Magdalene. And we're also going to see how gracious God is. The passage we're going to read is John 20 verse 1 to 18. So I'll read that now. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realise that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I am not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Keller writes that faith is both impossible and rational. What does he mean by this? By this he does not mean that no one can ever have a Christian faith. But just that we cannot have a faith in Christ without help from God. In this passage, Mary doesn't even consider that Jesus has risen from the dead when she finds the empty tomb. She says, they have taken the body. But Jesus says he would die and rise again. In Mark 9, he says, they will kill him and after three days he will rise. So, even to those who knew Jesus, faith didn't come come naturally. As Keller writes, We all have a spiritual blindness, which means that faith is impossible without the intervention of God himself. We also all have reasons to believe that there's a God, but we also have reasons to believe there's not a God. Thomas Nagel, a prominent American philosopher, highlights this when he says he doesn't want there to be a God. Nagel is showing here the dilemma that we all have. We all have reasons not to believe that there's a God. And so when dealing with the evidence, we aren't completely objective. Meaning that we have something to gain for them not being a God. If there was a judge who was faced with a case that involved a company that he had shares in, and if the decision he made impacted the amount of money that company had, would he be allowed to take a case? No, because 
the decision he made could impact how much money he had. He is impacted by the decision that was made. We face a similar dilemma when we are faced with the evidence of Jesus. We may be afraid of the claims of Christianity being true, because if it is true, it will have a huge impact on us. Keller suggests, therefore, that we doubt our doubts. We can't be completely unbiased in our opinion, whether there is a God or not a God. And so doubting our doubts and understanding why we doubt can be helpful. Are we doubting because we really question the fact of if there's a God? Or maybe because we don't want there to be a God? A good suggestion of a next step found in this book is prayer. If you have doubts and questions, why not ask Jesus? Here's an example of what we can pray. God, I don't know if you are there, but I do know what prejudice is like, and I am willing to be suspicious of it. Therefore, if you are there, and if I am prejudiced, help me get through it. Many people are anxious about if they have enough faith. They believe that they have the wrong motivation for wanting faith or may be afraid you don't have enough faith. But we should remember that we can't have a vibrant faith in Christ without help from God. In the passage, Mary faces the problem of a lack of faith. She is agitated, panicking and in tears and she is not able to see Jesus even though he's right in front of her. Jesus met her in this place and she didn't need to change anything. We all need this help from Jesus and in fact if you're concerned about finding faith in Jesus that may be a sign that he's already helping you get there. We have discussed how faith is not merely something that we think about but a personal encounter with Jesus but it is also important to understand that faith is based on evidence. You may have noticed that even though Jesus predicts his death and resurrection throughout the Gospels, the disciples aren't camped out at the tomb waiting for it to happen. Maybe you're wondering why Mary doesn't jump to the conclusion that Jesus has risen from the dead when she sees the empty tomb. The people in Jesus' day were just like us. They knew people don't rise from the dead. So something changed that made them believe. The disciples clearly had enough evidence. The evidence that convinced them and brought them to faith may be enough to convince you or to strengthen your faith if you're already a Christian. Nowadays, it's believed that if your knowledge and facts and certainty go up, your need for faith goes down. This is not what Christians mean by faith. Christian faith means in hoping that something is true and relevant so compelling evidence is one of the great boosts to Christian faith. Christian faith is not just relevant and exciting, but it's also true. And in fact, if it wasn't true, it wouldn't be relevant at all. An important example of evidence for the resurrection in this passage is the fact that Mary is the first eyewitness. In those days, women could not testify in Roman or Jewish courts and so if you were making up a story, you would not have chosen a woman to be the first eyewitness. There is no other reason that this would have been put in the Gospels unless it was true. In the second part of this passage, we see that God deals with Mary gently and lovingly. God addresses Mary as he does with many people throughout the Bible, with gentle probing questions rather than intimidating declarations. Asking questions helps a person discover and embrace the truth in their hearts. Jesus does this here. He asks Mary, why are you crying? Mary misunderstands Jesus' questions and thinks that he is the gardener. So Jesus makes another attempt to break into her heart and says, Mary. In John 10 verse 3, Jesus says that he calls his sheep by name and they follow him and know his voice. Here Mary recognises Jesus when he calls her by name. 
Christian faith is a personal relationship with God and Jesus died for you and calls you by name. Here Mary's faith comes by grace. She doesn't earn it. Jesus welcomes everyone into a relationship with him. And our salvation is not based on what we do, but what Jesus has done for us. We are saved through his work, not our own. Grace is the cause of faith, but it's also the content of faith. And faith is a gift from God. Keller refers to Mary as the first Christian because she believes that Jesus had died for her and she's had an encounter with the risen Jesus. The good thing is that we don't just have to sit knowing the love, but we are able to live in this love that has been shown to us. We can spend the rest of our lives tasting, experiencing and being shaped by this gracious love. Real faith connects us to Christ, not just for salvation from the penalty of our sins, but also for an ongoing, loving relationship with him. A final thing that we can take from this passage is that no two people come to faith in exactly the same way. John, Peter, Mary and Thomas later in the Gospels all approach Jesus differently and need different amounts of time, different proportions of evidence and experience to come to faith. Faith, admitting that you're a sinner, believing he died in your place, resting in his work rather than your own good work, committing your life to him in gratitude for his salvation. There are so many pathways to this kind of faith.